Good. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to a, another one of our Tring Book Festival evenings. Uh, can I welcome to the stage your host the, for the evening, Ted Saville, with Daniel Finkelstein and Roger Morehouse. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming on this rather dank evening. Um, on my far right is Lord Finkelstein, or Daniel Finkelstein, who's written uh, an excellent memoir and book we're going to talk about tonight. But also, of course, he's been an advisor uh, to um, William Hague and to John Major, and has worked very closely with David Cameron as well. He's got a podcast out for The Times on how to win an election, which some of you might have noticed. Uh, he's also, of course, a major contributor to The Times uh, on a range of issues, particularly one written today on the um, con conflict in Gaza. In the middle here is, I think he's Tring's best known historian, I think, um, uh, Roger Morehouse. <laughs> um, um, alumni, of course, of the great school down the road, Berkhamsted School, where he learned his trade. Uh, but more importantly, he's a writer of many books um, on Nazi history and other aspects of uh, historical study of the 20th century. Uh, his recent book is on a slightly obscure topic on the Holocaust, which has really brought um, the group to life. He's also written books on Berlin, books on um, opposition to the Nazis, and of course his famous book, perhaps I think I can say it's your most famous book, on the Devil's Alliance on the Nazi Soviet Pact was published, I think about four years ago. So welcome to both our speakers um, this evening. Um, so I'd like to start off with the first question, that's all right, um, and it's a sort of fairly general question. Can you both tell me, perhaps you can speak first, Roger, tell me why you wrote the book that you did, or the books you did? Um, this one um, kind of arrived with me um, back in, must have been about 2018, um, so I remember I had the proofs of the previous book, which was um, first to fight on my desk when this email arrived and said that this story about the Wadosh group, my forgers of the book, um, was sort of bubbling under. It was, it was being talked about in the Polish press a bit. It was being talked about in the Swiss press where they'd actually worked. Um, and my friend that sent me the email kind of said, well, what do you think about this? You know, this sounds like a book. And I read through what, what was available. And I thought this is actually really good. Um, it's pretty rare, I think, to have a story from the Holocaust, which is actually relatively positive, um, because the Holocaust obviously is one of the bleakest chapters of human history. Um, so to have a sort of a, a, a rescue attempt or a rescue account, which has not previously been talked about, I mean, that's, that's catnip to a historian right there, you know, the novelty element. Um, it's relatively positive. It's about a subject in most of my career, really, has been on Nazi Germany on Polish history, wartime history. So I've kind of swirled around the subject of the Holocaust without ever actually going into it. Um, so this kind of gave me the opportunity to address all of that in, a, in, a, in a, what I thought was a really fascinating package. So I delved deeper, I asked all sorts of questions, I spoke to the people who had done the research, I got this, what we would now call a data dump of uh, archival material. And that was just pre-COVID. And then, of course, I just sat through COVID and worked through it. And that's the result. Excellent. Well, first of all, it's really nice to be here with Tring's most famous historian. <laughs> I um, live in Pinner, so I'm a neighbor. I'd also like to thank Scylla Black for lending us the chairs from Blind Act. <laughs> um, I, I've, I suppose I've always known, even before I knew that I uh, could write books or that I even could write school essays that I was going to write a book about my parents because it's such an extraordinary story and there are so many people who are children of survivors of the Holocaust and, and as I was to discover even more so of what Stalin did to the Poles who can't who don't know anything about what their parents had experienced because their parents wouldn't talk to them and because the records are difficult to access, particularly on the Stalin uh, part of the story. And I knew that I wasn't in that position, that I could, that I knew a lot, uh, that I could trace really in great amount of detail what had happened to them. And I thought, I've always 
known that it was my family duty to tell that story. And then when I became a journalist, a couple of times I wrote articles about my parents, one, you know, about my mum. And there was a point where my mum went to, um, to meet Albert Speer's daughter, Hitler's planning minister and architect, and Hilda Speer and my mother had both stayed with the same family in America. My mother did after the war and Hilda Speer had won a competition and ended up there. So the BBC organized for them to meet. And at that time, I then wrote a column, a, a feature about my mom, which involved me interviewing her. And as I did it, and I, the, I received the response that I did, I realized people felt, you know, really, really found it fascinating story. Uh, and there was an awful lot in it. I just, you know, when, my, when I was 18, my mother gave one of her first talks uh, on the subject and she said to me um, do you think they'll be interested in the fact that I saw Anne Frank in Belson and I thought yeah yeah you know um, so I kind of knew that I, even my mum didn't realize how strong the story was I knew that it was a very strong story and so and I had a family duty to do it so I'm, I was happy to, to have completed the task. Thank you very much indeed that's great um, I want to sort of uh, move on now to a historical question of course which I uh, want to get the context of the books you're both, the periods you're both writing in. And it seems to me that the Nazi Soviet Pact is central to both stories. So, Daniel, do you mind telling us about why the Nazi Soviet Pact of um, August 1939, why is that so important to your family story in particular? Yeah, I found a letter from my uh, grandfather, Dolu. My father had been born in Lvov in 1929. His father was a very wealthy man. He was known as the Iron King because his iron and steel business was so big. Uh, and they had a, you know, a chauffeur and a, and a, a gardener and a beautiful architect built house. Uh, and um, Dolu had gone off to have a few days in a hotel uh, which they often stayed in by, uh, by the seaside and this letter was written from this hotel and I noticed on the date that it was written on the day that the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact was signed and I realized it was a sort of hinge in their lives uh, that after um, the this non-aggression pact so-called was really as I'd learned from Roger's brilliant uh, Devil's Alliance book it was really a pact to divide Poland and to, it was an aggression pact, not a non-aggression pact. And the bit of Poland that my father was in, which we now know as Lviv, uh, only became Ukraine, Soviet Ukraine, after the Soviets moved in and they arrested my grandfather and they sent uh, hundreds of thousands of Poles, including my father and my grandmother, to work in collect state collective farms. So it was... Uh, obviously the crucial uh, historical event in their lives because it had enabled Stalin to move into that part of Poland. But I also appreciated, and in fact, I consulted Roger on this to make sure that my historical understanding was correct, um, that, that, it, that, it, that it had given Hitler the freedom to invade Holland as well, uh, which is where my mother lived. My mother was uh, the daughter of um, one of the leaders of the anti-Nazi movement in, and leaders of German Jews in the 1920s and 30s. He created an archive um, that uh, was sufficiently threatening to the Nazis that when they rose to power, Goering had called my grandfather in person and said, you have to destroy this archive. He'd gone to Holland. Uh, and then he had taken the library to, to England, but the family had stayed in Holland. Uh, and therefore they were trapped in Holland. So the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact is the most important event in our story. Um, I'll, I'll jump in as well, if I may. Of um, course. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's, I mean, it's a fascinating event anyway. As you said, you both very kindly said, I have written about it. Um, Devil's Alliance, uh, available in all, <laughs> all good bookshops. Um, uh, and, but it, it, it's, it's really crucial to, to, I think, our understanding of the entire war. And it's, and it's kind of missing from the Western narrative. Um, and it's something that needs rectifying, I think. Because I think we tend to view World War II um, as a battle against one enemy, which was Nazi Germany. And certainly in the, in the opening two years of the war, up until Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union, it's actually a battle against two enemies, which is... Um, the Germans and the Soviets. So the Soviets were effectively our enemies for the first two years of the war, which we forget, right? Because of that great propaganda effort that turned Stalin from this dreadful ogre into Uncle cuddly Uncle Joe that sat on the sofa with, with uh, Churchill and smoked cigars. Tremendous propaganda shift prior to that. You know, the Soviet Union was our enemy. 
Um, in terms of my book here, it, it, it's re it is really important. All of that context is important because we, we're talking here about a Holocaust rescue operation. Um, so my, my forgers of the title was, was um, the, the Polish ambassador and some of his staff in Switzerland uh, in 1940, and they start producing, with the, with the aid of, of um, Jewish aid agency representatives, they start producing uh, forged Latin American passports using the Paraguayan honorary consul who was supplying them with blanks and then duly stamping them for a fee, uh, and then they'd be sent back into occupied <coughs> Poland. And, and with these passports, um, you could essentially stop the mechanism of the Holocaust. You could basically, you, you, you wouldn't be deported to Auschwitz-Birkenau, you might be deported in the other direction, you, you went into the concentration camp system as what the Germans called an exchange Jew, which meant that you were, there, you were then available to be exchanged for Germans abroad. That was the idea, right? So it effect effectively saved your life. It put you in a concentration camp, which was tough, and that you needed to survive a concentration camp, which took luck and a robust constitution, all of that, but it took you out of that mechanism, which ended in the gas chambers of Auschwitz-Birkenau, crucially. Um, but where this Holocaust rescue operation began was with, bizarrely, was with Polish Jews trying to escape from the Soviet zone of occupied Poland. So Poland, Poland, of course, is split in 1939 between the Nazis on one side, the Soviets on the other. And a lot of um, Polish Jews find themselves in that eastern zone. Uh, and bizarrely, a lot of them actually want to go west because they don't like being in the Soviet zone. So they think, we'll try our, chance, try our chances in the, in the German zone, which wasn't a great idea. But it, was, it shows you that that was not a holiday. It was a really tough place to be because they're, just as the Nazis have this sort of racial hierarchy with the Jews at the bottom, so the Soviets were imposing a class political hierarchy. And if you were middle class, if you had property, like Daniel's grandfather, you were in trouble. And the chances were you'd get arrested and deported. So this, this, the origins of this scheme lie in that eastern zone. The first few passports that they produced were for Polish Jews in the Soviet zone of occupation who were desperate to escape Soviet occupation, not the Holocaust. So it's, quite, it's kind of crucial to that narrative as well. The, the, the way that I put it is that the, 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 the Nazis arrest, arrested all the Jews, some of whom were shopkeepers, and the Soviets arrested all the shopkeepers, some of whom were Jews. Beautifully put. <laughs> um, so, Daniel, if I could um, ask you about this next, because there is a, a fascinating connection between the two books, I think, um, you've both been alluding to, that Roger's book is about the Vados group and what they did to uh, save uh, many Jews uh, from uh, death. And of course, you have a story connected to that relating to your mother's side of the family. Perhaps you could tell Absolutely. us about well, that. Well, uh, I'll tell you where one of these passports is. Uh, it's to the right-hand side of my desk. Um, and uh, the reason it's there is because my mother's on one of them. Uh, so um, this was a connection we made fairly on in, early on in your research and fairly early on in mine. My mother was an exchange Jew. So my grandfather uh, has um, escaped being trapped in Holland. He uh, ends up working for the intelligence services in both Britain and the United States. He's got what turned into one of the largest archives in the world of material about fascism. And the British government has ended in a war with, with the fascists without knowing very much about them. And just to give you a small idea of the sort of thing I'm talking about, uh, after the war, when it was discovered that Joseph Mengele, the doctor of death, who was on the rampway at Auschwitz, that he was probably in Argentina, the only way they could be sure it was because my grandfather had the only picture of him. Uh, and so he had collected all this information. He, he, would, he was involved in all sorts of things like, for example, when Hess lands in Britain, people think that Hess is a moderate. In fact, Alfred's able to show that he was really an extremist, which means that he's not a moderate, he's a crackpot. It's very different. And so he was involved in all of those things. He, he, but he is not with my grandmother and the girls, and he is able to work on trying to find them some papers. And he, he fails in a number of these endeavors. He's in the United States. Can he prove they're American citizens? He can't. Uh, they try a Cuban visa. It's a scam. They pay a lot of money. Nothing happens. Uh, they get a Palestine certificate. 
um, which says they were eligible uh, to go to Palestine, but that was really a sort of confection of the Jewish community. And um, it did ultimately end up with a couple of hundred people leaving Belson. Um, but as it happens, my family was not among them. But they also managed to get hold, for reasons the book explains, of uh, they have a sort of odd family collection. Alfred has Swiss connections because he spends some of the 1930s suing the publishers of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion in Bern. Uh, and in Bern is the center of where the, uh, where the uh, forgery ring um, that, that Roger uh, brilliantly illuminates uh, belongs. So it turns out that our books fit together like a, like a, a glove. And I hope that um, they're both storybooks. Um, but also history books. And I think we both actually, interestingly enough, got quite a similar approach so that we both want to tell a compelling human story uh, and what we want people to understand the structure of, of the oppression, not just, not just the individuals it happened to. Thank you. Um, so Rog, if I could ask you an additional question about the Rados group in terms of why up to this point it's been largely neglected and in addition to that, um, why do you think um, it, you, well, you sort of talked about why you um, want to write about it. Why do you think it's an important addition to our Holocaust story? I think I'll answer the second one first. And I think, um, I mean, obviously there's a, there's a tremendous human story there, which as Daniel's very generously described, I do try and bring out as far as possible. And that's not just in the forgers themselves and what they, you know, their motivations and how that scheme worked, which is, I think, in itself quite fascinating, because it it sort of ties into um, a, a sort of particular um, Nazi new, or German neurosis, which is about bureaucracy, right? Um, papers, please, that sort of mentality we all know from Hello, Hello. Um, you might think that, you know, the, the production of, you know, a passport, if, you're, if, you're, if your name is, you know, um, uh, Solomon Feldstein, and you're, you're an Orthodox Jew in the Warsaw Ghetto, and you only speak Yiddish, and you go up to your, the guard who's about to deport you, and you brandish a Paraguayan passport, actually worse than that, it's a facsimile of a Paraguayan passport, and you say, you can't do this to me, I'm a Paraguayan citizen, what do you think he's going to say? Because right? they knew that this was fake, the Germans. This, and this is why I, I found it so interesting, because it, it ties into this whole sort of German mania for, for bureaucracy. And a key thing here is that the Germans, in, in preparing the Holocaust, they made the victims of the Holocaust into non-people. So they, they robbed them of all their sort of identity, all of their, anything, anyone would, that would possibly speak for them. So you were robbed of your, um, your citizenship, you were robbed of any sort of official papers, any official identities. All of your official papers were supposed to be left behind or in, otherwise invalidated. So they created, as I describe it, an extra legal space where legal norms don't apply. And once you've done that, you can do whatever you like with the individual which is what they did, right? So all that my passport does for Solomon Feldstein is that it reimposes the possibility that somebody somewhere is watching and somebody somewhere cares. And that was enough for the Germans to go, oh, well, we better take him out of the line and put him with the other ones who are going to Bergen-Belsen rather than Auschwitz-Birkenau, right? That was it. So, so it, it actually worked. That wasn't necessarily by design by the forgers. That's just how it sort of meshed with, um, you know, the Nazi sort of psychosis on this, which I thought was quite, was fascinating. Um, so that aspect, I thought, you know, there's a lot of human stuff, not only there, but then the politics of this. And then, of course, in, the, in those that received the passports. Because for them, this was very often a last throw of the dice. It was something that they thought, well, it, you know, it's a faked passport how can it possibly do any good so very often you'd find that they would literally sort of play this last card at the last moment and be surprised if it actually worked and it got them pulled out of the line um, so there's there's the whole sort of you know the, the mentality of the of the, uh, the passport recipients themselves who are not sure that this is a sort of silver bullet it's not necessarily going to work but in extremists you give it a try you know so there's all of that sort of um, human drama there as well. And then, of course, they are in, if you're lucky, 
you end up in, in uh, Bergen-Belsen or one of the other camps. Vittel was another camp that was used. Um, you then have to survive through that period, possibly two years in Bergen-Belsen, which is a tough ask. Bergen-Belsen was an absolutely dreadful place. There's no systematized, industrialized killing in Bergen-Belsen, not like Auschwitz-Birkenau, but it still has a massive death toll. It still has you know, rife waves of disease, epidemics of disease through the late 1944, early 45. It's a horrific place to be. So you still had to survive Bergen-Belsen. So there's a tremendous amount of sort of human um, uh, uh, material in there, if you like. It's very interesting that you mention this LOLO because the, there are moments in the book where you see the German method. My mother was always puzzled when she was in Westerbork concentration camp before they went to Belsen. She ended up getting um, very ill and they actually cure her of that illness in order to send her to Belsen or, or potentially even to Auschwitz or Sobor to the gas chambers. It was this kind of methodological thing that the most obvious moment of which comes my, my mother's there's an there's a chapter in my book called betty from nottingham betty from nottingham was a friend of my um was was my mother's home help and later in our life she was a family friend uh and when i discovered her story because she'd left her testimony with my grandfather it was absolutely astonishing but there's a moment in it where she tries to escape from the gestapo by climbing out of a window uh but gets caught on the roof and dragged back through the window at which point the Gestapo officer said, you thought you could escape, but this does not happen with the Gestapo, right? I mean, it's exactly like hello, hello. And she, I know that she used those words because, because Bessie wrote them down uh, at the time. And there, there are lots of moments, but interestingly, this, that one of the contrasts is the Soviets weren't like that. So they, one of their characteristics was completely, un, to be completely uncaring the Germans would systematically deprive you of food, but the Soviets might do it by accident um, and or just because they weren't, they were totally uninterested. And one, one of the points in the story, my great grandmother um, is able to walk off from the train uh, that she's supposed to be deported to Siberia in and um, they can't be bothered really. They, they weren't, they didn't care the fact that she was nearly 80 and diabetic when they arrested her and they didn't care that she walked off either. Uh, so there's quite a difference in temperament. So, sorry, I was, I was going to come back to your, your question about why it's been forgotten as well. Um, I think generally, and I, and I, I would hope Daniel will, Daniel will agree, when, when the Holocaust starts being written about, which really isn't until the 1960s properly, um, and of course there's now sort of, you know, a good, uh, you know, 60 years of, of historiography and memoir and so on, um, but when it started being written about, it kind of came from, the material that was produced came from two different directions. One was sort of top down, which was official accounts and using official documents. And the other one is bottom up, which is using memoir material and diaries and so on, such as they are. So there were two very different approaches. Um, and with my subject here, for various reasons, which I'll explain, neither of those two pathways worked. The bottom-up pathway didn't work because almost all, and I would almost say all, but that's a bit of a you know, absolute, almost all of those that received passports from these guys, and it was about 10,000 people, um, they didn't know where they'd come from. So they, they themselves had written off these sort of letters of application, very often desperate to you know, send them off to Stockholm, to Istanbul, to, to Bern, to Paris, to wherever they could think of anyone that might possibly be able to help them. And if they were lucky, it landed on the right desk of somebody attached to this group. And it got processed and put into that process of producing a passport. And then the passport would, would arrive. But they didn't know that this came from the Polish embassy that the person in charge was the Polish ambassador, Alexander Wadosh. They didn't know that it had come from the honorary consul for Paraguay. It was a Paraguayan passport, of course. Um, but they didn't know where it, where it had actually come from. So for that reason, if that person survived the Holocaust, later wrote a memoir, um, this question of the Paraguayan passport was just a big open question as to where did that come from? Nobody knew. It was just a, you know, a big my, question. Mum certainly didn't know it. I mean, as in your, as in your no, story. My, my mum certainly didn't know it. And, um, and actually, I, stum I myself stumbled across it, writing about these Paraguayan passports on Twitter and the anniversary of my grandmother's death. And 
uh, somebody else said, you have these power grant passports, do they come from Switzerland? And I thought, well, that's actually the only thing I do know about them, which is how I then got pulled into finding out the same things that you mm. have, have written about in your book. Yeah. So that bottom-up pathway didn't work because they didn't know where they'd come from. And then the top-down top, top down pathway didn't work either because it was the Polish government and the Polish government in exile, which was in London at the time, that was linked to all of this. My representatives in Switzerland were you know, the ambassadors to the Polish government in exile. And of course, what happens in 1945? The communists come in take over Poland, and the government in exile is left sort of out on a limb, you know, still pretending to do party politics and to govern a country that no longer wants it, carried on incidentally until 1989 in the same, in the same building in London. Um, but all of its archive was left in London, nobody studied it, nobody looked at it, um, the, the, the ambassadors themselves and the diplomats all you know, did, retired and went off to do other things because they didn't want to work for the communists. So again, there's a dead stop there. So nobody looked at this material from the top down. Um, and actually, there's an absolute wealth of material, particularly on, on the Jewish policy of the government in exile, which is remarkable and remarkably generous. And one thing that comes out of my book is that the outside world in dealing with the Jewish question through the Holocaust is, I would say, at best indifferent and often hostile, right? And we assume, I think we assume when we look back on this period, we look back and we think, well, the outside world was kind of willing to help and it wanted to help, but it was just frustrated by circumstances or by logistics or by you know, other competing strategic aims. That's not really the case. That's not what comes across from, from the material that I've read. The outside world is often hostile yeah. to actually helping at all. And they, I mean, they, they... They try to ca they try to persuade the Paraguayans to cancel the passports. So you know, uh, if you're reading my story, you're seeing at this point almost the only lifeline for Greta, my grandmother, and her three girls. My mother being one of them. You see that there, uh, my my aunt Ruth had a diary that she kept in Belson with a single line of. of information about it one of which was as i said earlier about seeing anne frank uh in Belson, but she but a lot of times it was what they had for food or did not have and the days of and you can see this progressing uh and um the whole time while they've got this and you know uh, as the you know me writing it i knew that eventually there would only be 136 people who'd be able to use these passports for an exchange and through that entire time, the Allies were trying to, the American State Department in particular, was trying to persuade the Paraguayans to cancel the passports. And indeed, so much that they put it off that you mentioned Vittel, uh, and obviously the people who are in Vittel, those people don't survive, partly for a reason that I understood, which was that um, it just went on and on so long, the Germans sort of lost faith in it and begun to take them, but partly they took the polls first, as you explain in your book, which I didn't understand until I read it, uh, because the polls had seen too much and the Dutch, they thought would be better exchange products. Um, but the interesting thing about Vittel and that intern camp is that I stayed in it as a club med, I realized. <laughs> it is, you can go and stay in it if you like, it wasn't bad. Um, wow. But it's extraordinary that, I, I, it was hard to believe, but it definitely is true. Yeah. So, that, so that's the reason. So both pathways are kind of blocked off for that reason. And then it's forgotten. It doesn't become part of the narrative. And then we jump forward to you know, just, I think, 2016, so not long before I heard about it first. Um, the then Polish ambassador in Switzerland is having a reception, holding a reception in, um, in his residence in the embassy building. Um, and an elderly uh, Jewish guest at this reception comes up to him and says, um, you, know, th you know this is a holy place. And he says, no, I don't. What do you mean? He says it was here that, that uh, your predecessors um, arranged this uh, rescue operation. Absolutely no knowledge. And he asked, you know, as much detail as he could get. He set off one of his staff to, to investigate. And that's where that data dump that I mentioned uh, uh, originated from. So that's where the story kind of starts. That's where we start looking into the archive and looking at those documents. Um, so as I said, this is, you know, it's a genuinely new story, which um, is actually quite a rare thing. I mean, how many books have you read about the Dam Busters, for God's sake? Um, this is a genuinely new story that, we, that, you know, five years ago, we didn't know about. Roger and I had another extraordinary moment at a, an event that we did when this, uh, when this uh, 
Swedish, when the Swiss ambassador, uh, Jakob Kumoch, came to London, and we were both in the Wiener Library, which is my grandfather's library, and there was a gentleman in the audience who was very interested in his own family, uh, and, his own, and, his, and he had a page of a school book which included, a school list which included uh, Wadosh, uh, but also included my paternal grandfather. In other words, that the two, um, the two stories in my book are linked really through the Polish government in exile, of which a very close friend of the Finkelstein family, uh, Ostrowski, eventually becomes president. When I was a kid, I came to my grandmother's house and she had this big bunch of flowers. It was her birthday. And, so, and I said, oh, Granny, who sent you all these roses? And she said, the president of Poland. <laughs> And you know, she was getting on a bit, so I thought well, that's a bit of a weird thing to say. Uh, anyway, now I've discovered who that was. That was Ostrovsky. So the po so interestingly, through this um, involvement of these poles, uh, there is actually a link between these otherwise unconnected stories: the Polish and Stalinist um, uh, deportation of my father to the wastelands of Siberia, and my mother's experience in Belson and how that came to an end. Yes, so amazing. It's great to have two books that are, have a very positive um, trail with the passports and then with your own family as well uh, surviving. Um, there's a very interesting part towards the end of your book about Belson, how the random nature of who went on, who went free, who, who the Nazis decided, which it's quite interesting reading it. Can you tell us a bit more about why, how the Nazis operated, why there was no so coherence about yeah. who was saved and who wasn't? Well, look, so, um, but when you read my aunt's diary, you can see there's a rhythm to life in Westerbork. Westerbork had been a refugee camp established by the Dutch with Jewish money um, to house illegal immigrants who were coming into Holland particularly after Kristallnacht, after the November pogrom that took place in Germany. The border was pretty porous. People would also send their children, you know, alone on a train because they couldn't get out themselves. And these kids would be wandering the forest. The Dutch didn't know what to do. So they said to the Jews, we'll build this place, but you have to pay for it. But then eventually the Nazis take it over. So the Jews actually built uh, the, one of the most important concentration camps in Holland with, that, with, you, with the money of the community. In this place, uh, as my aunt's diary makes clear, there's a rhythm and every Tuesday a transport leaves uh, that goes evacuated to the east. What that actually means is sent to the gas chambers. Um, it's actually very revealing that terminology evacuated to the east because it suggests they realized sufficiently how evil it was that they didn't want to write down what they were actually doing uh, so they used a euphemism to disguise that, that what they were doing from historians but obviously it didn't work but uh, that it's interesting that they even bothered to to do that so um before these tuesday transports could take place there were a couple of days first that involved the discussion of how many, the decision by Gemeka, the man who ran the camp, how many people he was going to need to send that week to the east, what his quota was, uh, which depended on transportation and what the instructions were. Uh, then he had to decide what that week's exemption was. This was quite random. So, uh, for example, some weeks he was decided that all pregnant people and older people should be exempt. And then other weeks, those were the people exactly that the sort of people he thought should go. Um, but they did have a sort of consistency with an exemption if you had potential exchange value. Uh, and ultimately, uh, in the short, and the other thing that might save you is if you were related to somebody who had a war, who had some war experience. There were various things that might get you, give you some exemption that might last a little bit. And my family had two major bits one was that it had a palestine certificate but several times that was all cancelled that that was not an exemption anymore and then later on it ends up they end up having this paraguayan certificate and ultimately it's um somebody comes to works one down from eichmann comes to the camp and they are they're taken to belson by this point my great aunt um, Trudy, my, my, my grandmother's sister, her close sister, they lived virtually in each other's pockets, but her and Uncle Jan and Fritz, uh, who's my mother's first cousin, 
they're all sent to Sobibor, which you, you may not know of because in Auschwitz, they divided people between slave laborers and those they killed immediately. But in, in Sobibor, the lifespan of a Jew was three hours and there were no slave laborers. So people don't really know about Sobibor precisely because it was even more lethal than Auschwitz uh, and therefore nobody survives to tell, to tell of it. Uh, anyway, um, they, they, they avoid this fate because of their exemptions. They are sent to Belson. And in Belson then, the randomness is really twofold. One is, do you survive the disease and lack of food? As, the, as it progresses through, Himmler had set this camp up. He imagined it was going to be used for exchanges. The exchanges don't happen because the Allies don't really want to swap people. Um, so it goes on and on and eventually more and more people come from other camps that are closed down. There are these death marches that come towards uh, the center of Germany where Belsen is. And so the camp gets fuller and fuller. That's when Anne, Anne Frank arrives at the end of 1944. That's when my, uh, my um, aunt and my mum see Anne and Margot and then they die uh, of disease. Um, and just as it's getting worse and worse and worse, they're called uh, because pretty much at random, they have been selected for this exchange. Uh, at first, 300 people are taken from the camp. Only 136 of them actually get all the way uh, to Switzerland because on the way, the Nazis decide they've got too many people and somebody comes through the train and throws off uh, people. Essentially, they thought probably they were going to die. I think my research suggests they would go to, they would have gone to an internship, uh, to, an, uh, to an intern camp. But um, they, uh, my aunt says to this guard, I can't get off, my, my, my mother's too ill, which she was by this point. And he just shrugged and went, okay, stay then. And that's how they survived. Now there, I mean, there's a, one of the things that comes across and came across to me very strongly in writing the book was this element which i think you're sort of referring to of, of caprice you know that you, it wasn't enough to be physically robust and to be lucky and all of that it, you know it, your your life could turn on a moment you know on a glance or a you know or on the arrival of paperwork for example there was there was one family of four that i talked about um who were in vestibule um and their paperwork was delayed um uh, no, the paperwork came through, sorry, and the two, two of the children were ill, and we talked about earlier on that how they, they had to be healthy enough to be deported, right? So two of the children were ill, so they were kept aside, and the parents were sent straight to, to Auschwitz to be gassed, and the two children, because they'd been ill, were then uh, delayed, which meant that they got the paperwork that was coming in the post, and they went to Bergen Belsen and survived. So it all, it all turned on, you know, moments like that, just, you think, it, it's life can be an astonishing thing sometimes. One thing that I wanted to mention here is that for all that caprice and for all that sort of horror of the Holocaust, there are these, one of the things that's crucial to understanding how the, how the Germans did what they did was that they were very good at cultivating hope. That might sound a strange phrase to use, but this is why they use all of these euphemisms like we just mentioned, you know, deportation to the East that they sent the, the official narrative was that those that were deported from places like Vestibul were going to a, a work camp in the east right that was always the narrative and this of course is how they controlled large numbers of people and got them to do what they wanted to do without using brute force and large numbers of guards and so on they did it by cultivating hope that the thing that was awaiting for them at the end of the railway tracks was marginally better than where they were at the moment that was the narrative that they gave um, and there are so many examples of this. There was one from Bergen-Belsen where they wanted to get rid of a large group of exchange Jews because they realized, because the outside world, as I said, was indifferent, wasn't playing ball. So the Germans lost patience. Like, well, you know, let's just get rid of them. They package up, you know, two and a half thousand exchange Jews, mainly Poles, and they tell them, they don't tell them they're sending them to Auschwitz. They say, we're sending you to another camp and it's called Bergau, right? And it's up near Dresden, and it's really, it's just been built. It's very nice. The food's much better than here. The barrack blocks are much better than these. So, and, and there are Jews who are actually applying and asking, can I be on the transport to go to Bergau, right? Bergau doesn't exist. It's all a ruse to make them compliant so that they get on the train 
and they don't revolt and they don't try and run away. It's cultivation of hope, which is kind of like the most cynical, the cruelest thing you can possibly imagine in those circumstances. The, the Russians were less bothered with that. Uh, I mean, that's the, the interesting thing. So um, my mother always used to say that she, she was on a train that went from Amsterdam to, uh, to Westerbork, and it was a horrendous, it was so hot that day, and they had a lot of clothes on. It was, lots of people stifled in this, even in three hours. But my father was actually on a, on a train for three weeks that went to Siberia. I mean, ever, but they, even they do lie. They say that they're going to meet my grandfather um, they know very quickly that that's not the case. So the Soviets were, were quite a lot more sloppy with a lots of the with lots of these things, uh, and you know it wasn't it was obvious to people that they were being sent back somewhere hopeless, uh, and it was all much more chaotic, uh, but still pretty lethal. I've got one more question I could ask to both of you, please, before we open up questions uh, to the audience. There's a memorable part in the towards the end of your book, uh, Daniel which says this, public interest in Stalin's crimes didn't come. It's never come. Uh, nobody invited dad to tell his story in schools. Um, and of course, by implication, of course, people in, uh, asked your mother to tell her story. And there are lots of accounts in your book about that. So can you um, tell me why you think that was the case, that your yeah. dad's story is largely ignored. I mean, look, it wasn't as though dad's story is not compelling. I think that when yeah. people read it, uh, this extraordinary thing of being on this state collective farm there in this, my, my grandmother ends up having to, because they're kicked out of the cow shed because the cow needs the cow shed back. So they, they create a, a house made of dung bricks and they live in it through winter with almost no food and it's below freezing inside and my grandmother is going to collect the water from the uh, lake and then coming back and teaching my father uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey and um, the poems of Schiller and things like that. So it's an extraordinary story. It was very compelling, but people were not interested in it. I think there are really two or three reasons. Roger, but I've been interested in Roger's perspective. One is just because the Soviets won the war. So one of the first documents I pulled out of the first folder of family papers uh, can, was an extraordinary document. It was the indictment of the Nuremberg conspirators. Alfred, my grandfather, was, had helped with the Nuremberg trials because all of his documentation was vital uh, for that. And he had his own copy of, at home of the indictment of the Nuremberg conspirators. And um, when I read it, mainly for his part of the story, I realized that all of the crimes that the Nazis were prosecuted for, the Soviets had also committed exactly those crimes. Not, not in the same instances, but exactly the same crimes, the conspiracy, the crimes against humanity, the crimes against peace. Um, so the, uh, the, the crimes of war, they'd done all of those things. But they end up being the prosecuting authority at Nuremberg. So although uh, it's commonly said, you know, we want to make sure that Nuremberg isn't victor's justice, there was a lot of element of Nuremberg that absolutely was victor's justice. So the first reason is simply because the Soviets won the war and are seen as our allies. Um, secondly, uh, I think it um, is because the Nazis employed these extraordinary novel methods uh, are this kind of factories of death. When, when Dolu, my grandfather, uh, my father's father, is sentenced as an antisocial element on the, for having strengthened the might of capitalist Poland to eight years in the Gulag, he's going to die, right? He can't survive uh, for eight years. He's 50 um, and uh, he's going to be put to work pulling logs to the to the river, having walked two hours there and back through snow and not being fed at all. So that, that's exactly what they're doing. They're killing him. But it's not the same as what happens to Trudy with this um, and, and Fritz and Jan with this factory of death. And I think there's something incredibly compelling and awful about that, that that draws the attention and makes me look at it. And the third thing is a bit more, um, a bit vaguer. But there is a general feeling that um, the, that communism was a good-hearted experiment that just went a bit wrong. Um, uh, you know, oops, we killed uh, 20 million people. And um, the, uh, you know, and I, I strongly don't believe that. I think both of the communism and fascism were attempts to uh, destroy bourgeois liberal democracy without any idea what a humane alternative to bourgeois liberal democracy might be. And whilst fascism, 
was revealed as being evil uh, through the Holocaust. People haven't glommed on to the fact that the, the failure of the, the nature of Stalinism wasn't accidental and therefore it doesn't uh, and it's often regarded as quite crude to point out the obvious similarities between my parents' story, which they never doubted. I, I would say this, my mother always had this statement, it's not a competition when she was asked um, wh who was worse, Hitler or Stalin. And that is very important. It's not necessary uh, to, to equate them, but that the stories were similar in nature, undoubted. I, I would agree with all of that, Daniel. I've, I've obviously schooled you well in, in uh, reading, <laughs> reading The Devil's Alliance. Um, um, no, I'd agree with all of that. I mean, it, I always say that, you know, in 1941, when Hitler attacked Stalin, uh, Operation Barbarossa, um, and the West kind of, which uh, up until that point was, was in fairly desperate straits, as in Britain, really, Britain and the Empire, um, fairly desperate straits, we kind of, you know, Churchill was actually really instrumental in, in paving the way for that, what becomes the Grand Alliance. He makes everything possible to, to grab hold of Stalin as an ally, um, seeing that that is his salvation and Britain's salvation as well. So, and Churchill, of course, was the great anti-communist of, of the age, absolutely, you know, bar none. Um, so he was very well aware that we were allying ourselves with the devil to defeat Beelzebub, right? Um, but in the process, you know, the, the necessities of, of, of the propaganda war and the creation of the Grand Alliance and all of that stuff meant that we sort of shaved off the devil's horns and we made him humanized and we made Stalin into Uncle Joe, cuddly Uncle Joe, as I said before. And that's a very, very strong message. It's a very durable message. And I can remember when I was publicizing, uh, doing a um, uh, lecture tour with, uh, with the Devil's Alliance, um, at the end of one of the a talk like this one, we had, we had a sort of open forum of questions and an elderly chap at the back stood up and, and said, I just want to say, how dare you say bad things about Stalin? That's how durable that mentality is, right? Um, the simple answer is read a history book, you know? Uh, so absolutely, I agree with, agree with that entirely, but it's, they're very durable ideas. And, 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 uh, and as we say, it took the Holocaust to disgrace Nazism. Communism has really escaped its, its Nuremberg. It's escaped its grand, grand revelation of its horror. Uh, unless we read you know, the right history books, it's not really public knowledge in the same way as, as the Holocaust is. So it, it gets a free pass and it still gets a free pass. Yeah, thank you. Um, so now's the chance for some questions. So, um, I think a mic is coming around. There is a there is a roving mic. If, if you've got a question, wait for the microphone. Obviously, there's a virtual audience. Uh, we'll do three questions downstairs, and uh, there's only one microphone. And then, if there's any questions upstairs, uh, if you could put your hands up anyway, and we'll find you. Oh, hi! Thank you both for a really insightful um, talk or chat about from personal and factual point of view. Um, I hope you don't mind me asking, but um, on such an emotional subject. Uh, both personal and um, factual again. How did you find this um, affected your research dealing with it? How, and how did this impact uh, when you were actually writing? And also, um, how do you really, how do you feel it impacted upon your narrative and to what extent? So um, in my case, uh, there, there were two different uh, reactions. One of them was actually, and this will sound odd, joy. Uh, and the reason for that not, is not just that my book ends with my parents meeting each other, having a, a very happy life, and they were very keen to stress that they lived rather than survived. Um, but, but also, I've, I learned a lot about relatives that I only knew the name of, or sometimes didn't even know that. Uh, and I fell in love with these people. Um, I read their correspondence, you know, I was lucky enough, I, we had lots of correspondence, um, wit you know, eyewitness statements, I had a lot of information. So, and I, and I was able to, to learn about these people. And, uh, you know, my grandfather, uh, Dolly, who'd always been quite a sketchy figure to me, became somebody that I, whose character I knew. I read a lot of newspaper articles. I read what other people said about him. There were various documents my grandmother had kept, which were uh, 
part of a compensation settlement scheme that she was involved in, which she told a lot of stories about his character. So I, I found that wonderful. But obviously there were moments, and in particular, researching and writing about Sobibor that were quite difficult. And there were moments when I read the audio book, I had to read more than once, uh, because I find them difficult to get through. So it's not, uh, and how did it affect the narrative? Well, look, I, I wanted to make sure that um, the narrative was compelling, and I tr but, I, but I want the reader to make their own mind up what they think about these things. So I didn't fill it full of my own political opinions or my own emotions. I just tried to tell the story. And the mo my job, I thought, was to structure the tale in a way that, that pulled people through and made them want to read the next chapter. What was going to happen to these people? Where did it go? And not feel as though they kind of knew all that at the beginning. That was very important. And then I felt I was doing my job if I did that. And I was doing... And I felt that was satisfying because I felt I was doing honour to their memory. Um, yeah, I mean, as a, as a historian, you are supposed to be, you know, 100% objective and, you know, hover over the battlefield, as it were, like some sort of weird Valkyrie, um, you know, with a, with a bird's eye view. Um, the reality is, is much harder to achieve um, that sort of objectivity and particularly as you rightly identified in your question when you when you're dealing with really emotive material then the Holo it doesn't get much more emotive than um in a holocaust testimony um so i mean i have it's a wrong word but i have the sort of benefit as i said before of having worked around this area um for sort of 20 odd years so in a way you get sort of hardened to it to be honest and you 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 do allow you rather you don't allow it to affect you you allow yourself to sort of take a step back and be that that objective you know bird's eye view character but even then there were some moments of when when i was writing this book where where you read a passage and you just have to sort of take a breath and you know go and make a cup of tea or whatever it is because it's so harrowing emotional uh revolting even some of them and some 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 of the material that i was reading was was truly awful um at the same time i think a lot of you know when you're writing when i write and, and i think both books are remarkably similar actually in approach um like daniel said i mean i do the same thing is that i i love a set piece i love a sort of a human story i love using that as a sort of dramatic set piece to drag the reader in and then you once you've done that and you've got the reader engaged i'm kind of betraying all my secrets here um, but once you've dragged the reader in, then you can do some sort of, you know, serious history, if you like. You don't start with something dry and boring. You start with a human story. And you can drag them in and, and then explain what was going on in deep, more detail. Um, so, I, you know, there was no shortage of that material, which, which was fantastic. So from, on one res in one respect, for me as, as a writer, was was brilliant, because there's no shortage of that human material. But at the same time, some of it was even hardened as I am, uh, was was tough to, to, to stomach. Um, I haven't read these two books yet, but I look forward to reading them. Um, a question for Roger, and then another one for you, Daniel, if you don't mind, some sort of two-parter. Um, Roger, I live in Switzerland now, although I was born down the road in Berkshire. Um, how did the Swiss react to all of these activities happening in Bern, knowing the way I know the Swiss today? Uh, yeah, is that, the, is that it? That's the question to you. Brilliant. And then to Daniel, I'm curious as to know how your father came out of Siberia. Was he out with the Second Corps, with uh, Anders and his crew? So that's a two-part. Right, uh, we'll do Switzerland first. You're absolutely right. I mean, Switzerland um, is this kind of island of, you know, from 1940 onwards, this sort of island of democracy and freedom in a totalitarian sea, right? If you imagine it in that way. Um, so this is what enables the Wadosh group, my, my forgers, to do what they're doing. But at the same time, Switzerland is not entirely free, right? So it, it, it's still under pressure from the Germans to a large extent. So the Swiss way of dealing with the pressure from the Germans was to be, on the one hand, overly belligerent. So to say, we, we'll, we'll defend Switzerland to the last man and make very big show of putting lots of money into, into fortifications in the Alps and things like that, which the Germans would you know, have to lose so many men and so many tanks to get to 
before they even had to engage them. So they were overly belligerent on the one hand. And on the other hand, they sort of bent over backwards to um, uh, almost accommodate every German wish. And this is where this comes in with this story. Because the Gestapo got wind of this, that this operation was going on. They sent, there was a couple of military intelligence agents that were sent to try and infiltrate the group in 1942 unsuccessfully. And after that, they, they pressurized the, the Swiss police to basically shut it down, which is the same message, incidentally, that the state, the US State Department is giving to the Swiss as well. So the US State Department is saying exactly the same thing. Shut this down, it's illegal, they can't do this, it's not allowed, right? So State Department is in some pretty ugly company at that point. Um, the Swiss do that, so they, they first go after each of the, the, the forgers to try and you know, haul them before a court, that doesn't work. They then go for the honorary consuls, which they succeed in having their authority as honorary consuls withdrawn. So by the end of 1943, they've effectively shut it down. Um, what's fascinating here is that you have two diametrically opposed views of how things should be. So you've got Alexander Wadosh, who is the Polish ambassador, who is heading up a forgery operation from his embassy. Right? This, to a Swiss mind, is literally unthinkable. Right? The sanctity of official documents, the sanctity of the position of an ambassador, all of that. To the Swiss mind, this is like, what planet are these people on? But for the, Pol for the Poles, and Wadosh himself had gone through, you know, he'd lived in the uh, Austrian partition of Poland in 19, in, in, uh, prior to the First World War. He'd been, he'd been uh, exiled by the Austrians, by the Habsburgs in 1915, and had escaped from exile using a, pa a false passport. So even in his own history, in his own life, he'd had this experience of benefiting from false paperwork. So he knew that. And also he'd lived through uh, occupation, right? He'd lived in... Poland that was then occupied by the Austrians where he lived and, and the Russians and the, and, the, and the Germans. So he knew how sometimes you have to make decisions that you'd not ordinarily norm, not make, right? You had to do the right thing, even if it kind of looked wrong. Uh, and that, that's a very sort of Polish attitude. They call it conspiracja. It's kind of living two lives at the same time. Um, and he'd lived that. And for the Poles of his generation, that was, that was their lived experience. It wasn't just sort of folk memory from the 19th century. They'd lived it, right? So for him, then later in life, becomes an ambassador, fine, right? But he still brings with it, with himself, that, that attitude that sometimes you have to break the rules. And that's okay too. Which to a Swiss mind, as, a, as I'm sure you'd testify, is completely off the scale. So there's a really, there's a, a, you know, when the Hollywood film is made, I'm sure they'll make much of this, mm -hmm. but there's, there's this wonderful juxtaposition of these two absolutely opposing viewpoints. And Wadosh actually goes in, he's called in to see the foreign minister, um, basically hauled over the coals. You know, what are you doing? Why are you, why are you allowing this to happen? And they're expecting him to sort of back down and say, I'm very sorry, I'll, I'll discipline my staff for what they're doing. And he says, no, no, we're doing the right thing. I'm, I'm, I'm fronting this up and I'm defending my staff for doing it. This is, we're, we're, this is a humanitarian operation. We're trying to save as many lives as possible. And to the Swiss mind, you know, this just doesn't make any sense. And the, and the response from the Swiss is, uh, I don't care what you're doing, just don't do it on Swiss soil. <laughs> that sort of sums it up. So there's a, that juxtaposition I thought was, was, was delicious. I mean, let me let me answer your uh, questions. I, I uh, in my among my father's papers in a suitcase uh, that was left uh, was a plastic bag full of letters, and these were letters that were sent by the family that lived in Lviv or was Lviv as it had become sent to my father and my grandmother uh, to there to Siberia to the state collective farm, and it was actually how they lived because it often was accompanied by food parcels. Uh, and lots of these letters describe the food parcels, but some of them also describe uh, the political environment. They have to do it in code using words that are difficult to decipher, but once I'd worked out what the code was, I, I saw that what they were doing all the time was sending uh, optimistic messages about the defeat of Hitler, by uh, who at that point obviously was Stalin's ally, by, um, by the British. Uh, these were false. Uh, reassurance, but they were reassurance nonetheless. The authors do not realize the irony of this, which is, had they been right, 
uh, then undoubtedly my dad and my grandmother would have died in that collective farm. They nearly died the first winter, they would have died the second or the third winter. But they were not right, because obviously Hitler invades the Soviet Union, the alliance breaks, and as part of the new arrangements, Stalin has to agree an accord with the, um, with the Poles, which he doesn't want to do. And it involves an amnesty uh, for all the Poles that they've deported. The, the Poles were very offended by this idea of amnesty because they weren't guilty of anything, but ultimately it was the best that they could do and it did lead to the freedom uh, of people. One of the other elements of the pact was that an army would be formed um, and the idea was the Polish army would be under Soviet command originally and the Poles thought this is going to be led by all the officers that have been arrested. Uh, the only problem with that is that Stalin shot all the officers, right? But no one knows that at this point. They don't know it till years later when uh, some thousands of these bodies turn up in the Katyn woods, but he shot all the officers, including a friend of, of our families whose story I tell in the book. Um, the result of that is that they have to find someone to head the army. And there's one person they're holding in the Lubyanka uh, who is, um, uh, you know, he's sort of emaciated, he's been beaten, he's starving, uh, he's ill, um, and, but he wasn't held with the main group because he'd been injured in the battles. And they go, and Beria himself, the head of the NKVD, head of KGB effectively, goes to his cell and says to him, uh, you're going to be free and we're putting you in charge of an army. So he's a bit startled by this, you know, they let him go, but he hasn't got any shoes and he's got a suitcase, which is in fact someone else's and contains someone else's swimming trunks, not his own <laughs> stuff. Um, and he put him in charge of an army and this was Vladislav Anders. Uh, they pick someone who turns out to be quite heroic and the way in which he's heroic is that um, he realizes he has to get the polish deportees to which my father and grandmother have linked up with him out of the soviet union they can't serve the soviets they need to serve the british not only do the soviets not want that they want to keep them there maybe even some of them to go back to the collective farms the British don't want it either. There's an extraordinary bit of correspondence where the British say, um, if we leave them with Stalin, he'll be able to let these people starve uh, and it won't embarrass him, but we can't let them starve. So we'll have to feed them if we got them. So let's delay receiving them. Anyway, I mean, and then somebody else puts some, um, I don't think this would read very well to a future historian. It might, <laughs> it might have been better not to write this down. I mean, that's just what they said. It. Um, so, uh, this document's extraordinary. Anyway, the, um, he does manage to persuade the, the Soviets and the British to allow him to go out. There's a restaurant called De Keys in near South Ken Tube Station, if you're ever interested in Polish food. And one of its best aspects, because I sometimes go and eat there, is to eat there underneath the portrait of General Anders, who undoubtedly was one of the heroes, along with Henry Morgenthau, and also my grandmother's. Uh, who saved my mother's life and my father's life. Hello, um, my question's for uh, you, Roger Morehouse. Um, I'm just, could you just clarify this issuing of passports? Because I've also read that passports were issued by various other neutral countries during the Second World War to assist um, Jewish people in trouble particularly from Sweden, also from Portugal, and also Nicholas Winton from this country issued documentation to help people leave Europe. How does your narrative differ from that? Because that's what I'm aware of already. I was slightly confused about this business of forging passports. And if they're going to forge a passport, why a Paraguayan one? Why not forge a Swiss passport or something? If you're going to go to the trouble of forging a passport, why not pick a passport that's more credible than a South American one? <laughs> Yeah, good Thank question. Um, there are there are you know a few people doing similar things. So there was um, uh, uh, the British passport officer in uh, Vienna before the war, just before the war, called Major Kendrick was was issuing um, visas to anyone that, that wanted one. For example, there's a chap called Kuni Sugihara in 1940 in Kaunas was issuing Japanese visas to anyone that wanted one. So there are various cases of, of people doing similar things. Um, I think the peculiarity with this is the scale, that they issued passports for 10,000 individuals. Um, the, and, the, and, how it, and also I think crucially how it sort of, as I said before, played into that Nazi mania for, for, for um, uh, bureaucracy in that sense that it, 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 um, 
it worked very effectively for that reason. Not that they knew it would at the beginning, but that's how it tended to work. That you've got this recategorization of the recipients as exchange Jews. Um, why they chose Paraguay was because um, they realized pretty early on that the vast majority of their recipients, about 70% of the people who received their passports were Polish Jews. And for, for almost all of those individuals, they had no paperwork at all. So they would have had perhaps paperwork from the old Polish Second Republic that was declared defunct after the defeat in 1939. So the vast majority of them had no paperwork at all. So they needed something foreign. So you couldn't just produce you know, a Polish passport, which they could do legally, um, but that would be no good for the German authorities because they'd also declared that you know, Poland didn't exist anymore. So you have a passport for a place that doesn't exist. Um, so they used Paraguay because they knew this honorary consul whose name was Rudolf Hugli, he was a local Swiss barrister and former diplomat himself. And he'd been um, active already in 1938 in issuing Paraguayan passports illegally um, to uh, Austrian Jews trying to escape into Switzerland. So they knew that he was, you know, biddable, bribable, effectively. Um, and he wasn't just doing it, it wasn't just venality that motivated him, it's also, it's also quite principled. He was very Christian, very profound Christian faith, so he, he wanted to do the right thing in dealing with people in, in extreme circumstances. He also made a lot of money out of it, let's, let's be honest. Um, but So he was a Swiss in Switzerland, Paraguay didn't have official representation, so his mentality and his venality meant that he was quite biddable. So as long as they could keep paying, he would keep producing Paraguayan passports for them. But they were real, I mean, the one you look at, they're real documents. So the reason they can't do a Swiss one is because that would involve actually forging them. Yeah. Whereas what, what they were doing was, the forgery was the lie, right in the middle of the, the document that my very un-Paraguayan mum was Paraguayan. <laughs> So got, yes, it was real. Got time for one more question, I'm afraid, possibly for Daniel. Thank you, thank you, take that, Dre. No pressure. Good evening. This is to both of you. Um, is it true that in 37-38, Molotov and Stalin had been seeking a pact with Britain and France, but it had been rejected several times by Chamberlain and the Conservatives, because of anti-communism? Or would that have delayed or maybe even stopped the war before it even began? Thank you. Uh, More for you. Yeah, it's yeah. Your idea. Um, <laughs> the difficulty with that was that the the Soviets, uh, if you look at Russia's attitude today, you know the Kremlin's methods kind of don't change. So anything from that period, that, you know, reaching out to potential uh, uh, approach for a treaty or some sort of settlement uh, was al almost always a means to an end. Uh, from the Soviet side. And the, and the Western powers knew that very well. Even Chamberlain, who has such a bad reputation as the great, you know, Arch of Pisa uh, of Munich and so on. But he was quite clear in uh, being anti-Soviet. And they, the British and the French were, were motivated to a large extent by a very realistic view of what the Soviet Union was, which was essentially a rogue state, right? So they weren't actually minded to have any sort of agreement with, with the Soviets either. And this is the problem that you have in 1939, when there are these approaches made, and the British and the French send uh, emissaries to Stalin to try and arrange uh, a, uh, some sort of pact, some sort of def def defensive pact to encircle Nazi Germany so that it can't attack Poland. And the first thing the Soviets say is, well, of course, if we're going to be attacking the, or defending against the, the Germans, we have to have access across Polish soil, right? And the Poles say, uh, hang on, that's not happening again, because we had that for 123 years. Uh, we just defeated the Bolsheviks in 1920 uh, at the Battle of Warsaw. So there's no way that the Red Army is coming across Polish soil to, to confront the Germans, right? So that was kind of a sticking point. If you view it from the Polish perspective, you understand why. Um, again, uh, as much as anything, the, the Western powers were realistic about, about the Soviet intentions. So that, even that, those em emissaries sent to Moscow in, in 1939 are sent with the instruction to go very slowly because they want to basically talk out the campaigning season. They still had a campaigning season in those days. Um, where you know you wouldn't really be making war in November, you had to do it in September, October. Um, so they were 
told to go very slowly in the negotiations to hopefully talk out the campaigning season. Um, Hitler, of course, blunders in with Molotov, with uh, Ribbentrop, one of the stupidest men ever to disgrace the name of diplomacy, uh, who goes to Moscow and he basically gives Stalin everything that he wants. Economic relationship with, with, with Germany, which is crucial. Um, all the territory that, that the Soviets claim, Baltic states, Eastern Poland, Bessarabia from Romania, Finland, you know, the sh a shopping list of territories. Um, and of course, he gets to remain neutral in the coming conflict. So for Stalin, it's like, you know, fully boots. This is, you don't get a better offer than that. So that's where he sort of kicks the British and the French out and says, I'm going with Hitler, right? It's, it's very rational, it's very brutal, it's uber real politique. But the British, as I come back to that, the British and the French are very realistic about what the Soviet Union is. So they don't want an alliance with Stalin either because they know what that means. And it means that they are, are getting into bed with the devil. So if that's where you're coming from the question, that's, that's the answer. It's, I've really only got two things to add to that as a masterly account by the person who sort of knows most about this probably in the whole country. Um, first of all, you don't end up reading my a book and hearing what happened to my dad and end up thinking, I wish we'd had an alliance with them sooner. Um, uh, and the second is, you're right about Ribbentrop, and I hope everyone who lives in Tring understands that Ribbentrop lived in Pinner. He <laughs> did, on Pinner Hill. Thank, on that note, thank you so much to both of you for that entertaining um, chat. And uh, both uh, Roger and Daniel's books will be available if you'd like to buy them, sign copies in the foyer. Yes, uh, and they'll be signing to the right in the foyer as well. So, so uh, thank, sorry, you could carry on. Thank you very much for coming and thank you to you two for the conversation. <laughs>